of the Justice Committee. If you can do the needful with any electronic devices, there's apologies from Linda Din Dillon and Emma Rogan, and uh, Gemma Dolan and Doug Beatty will be here um, shortly. And if the clerk can indicate now if any members have authorised their vote as per the relevant standing order. Under standing order 1156, uh, Linda Dillon and Emma Rogan have delegated their votes to Gemma Dolan. Okay. Um, there's the draft minutes then, members, in pages 5 to 9 of the meeting pack. And if you're content that they're a true reflection of the meeting, then I'll sign them unless there's Thank any you. amendments. Content? Sure. No problem. Um, matters arising. Uh, there's a letter from the Minister of Justice regarding the Northern Ireland temporary resting place. And I refer members to pages 11 to 12 of the meeting pack. The Minister has written regarding um, the NITRP, and she's indicated that whilst there's agreement for the short term use of the site, the longer term options have yet to be explored, and Department of Justice officials are taking this forward. The Minister has extended an invite to committee members to visit the facility first hand and to help set a context for the future of the facility. Uh, so, if members are content, we'll factor in a future visit to the site um, whenever it's appropriate uh, to do so. Um, members agreed? Agreed, yeah. Okay. Committee Forward Work Programme, consideration of the evidence and informal deliberations of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill will start at the first meeting in September. And prior to the discussions, the Senior Assistant Bill Clark will brief the committee on issues relating to the scope of the work. So, members, it's there just to note the updated Forward uh, Work Programme. Noted. Item 3, informal meetings with individuals, page 3 to 4 of the table pack, um, has the information. The committee agreed at our meeting on the 9th of June that we would hold private informal meetings to hear directly from individuals who suffered domestic abuse. A number of individuals indicated in their written submissions on the bill that they would be content for the committee to contact them for further information, discussion, women's aid and the men's advisory project were asked if they could uh, identify some other individuals. So it's proposed that the committee would be divided into two groups in order to increase capacity for hearing uh, from the individuals and this will help ensure that an individual um, won't be overwhelmed by speaking to such a large group of members about their experiences. For purposes of the informal meetings, the suggested groups um, is myself with Gemma Dolan, Gordon Dunn and Rachel Woods and then the Deputy Chair Linda Dillon with Doug Beatty, Shania Bradley, Paul Frew and Emma Logan. Um, the meetings are to be held remotely through the Starleaf or Microsoft Teams facility um, and uh, again if members need assistance in accessing um, their tablets for this, um, the committee will be able to support them in that respect. Um, a small number of meetings are likely to be held towards the end of this week or early next week and the remainder will then take place in early uh, September. And details of these meetings will be held or circulated to members as arranged. So if members are content um, that we would note um, the proceedings for holding these arrangements. Are they held here or? They're going to be held remotely. Remotely, yeah, yeah. working from home then or from our office. Through whatever. the Starleaf facility, yeah. Right, thank you. Okay, item four. Um, at our meeting on the 23rd of June, the committee agreed that it was content with the proposal for a statutory rule to bring into operation the Attorney General's human rights guidance for the PSNI and the PPS relating to the application of Section 5 of the Criminal Law Act 1967 to victims of serious sexual offences and those to whom they make disclosures. The statutory rule has been laid um, on the 24th of June. It's subject to negative resolution. There's been no changes from the uh, policy content since the uh, SL1 was considered by the committee. The stat rule comes into operation on the 29th of uh, June. It's convention that rules do not come into operation until 21 days after they were laid uh, to ensure the Assembly can carry out scrutiny of the rule before it comes into operation. The 21-day rule should not be breached unless there is a compelling reason to do so. The AG advised that the 21-day rule has not uh, been adhered to in this case as his tenure uh, ends on the 30th of June. The examiner and stat rules is likely to comment on this matter in a report on the statutory uh, rule which will be provided to the committee in due course. So, members, um, if we are content um, with the statutory rule which is subject to the findings of the examiner of statutory rules on the technical aspects of the rule, then I will formally put the question to the committee. Okay, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 113, the Attorney General Human Rights Guidance 1967, to victims of serious sexual offences and those to whom they make um, disclosures. 
uh, Order Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. And in five, <coughs> Department's finance update, the written briefing, uh, pages 64 to 115 of the meeting pack and pages 6 to 18 of the table pack has the relevant papers. The Department has provided a written briefing that gives an update on financial issues. This includes some new matters that the Department has drawn attention to, such as revised timetable for the laying of the DOJ annual report and accounts 2019-20, potential emerging issues in relation to the costs of the impact of changes to the Working Time Directive, and the current position with regard to the Industrial Tribunal on legal staff. The uh, response to the committee's questions following our evidence session on the 4th of June is at pages 73 to 76 of the meeting pack. Um, this includes the Department's input to the Northern Ireland Audit Office on expenditure of COVID-19 related activities, um, which details expenditure for the temporary resting place, the police service, the prison service, the courts and tribunal service and PPE uh, equipment across the justice sector. The Department has also provided a detailed breakdown of the type of support provided by the prison service or to the prison service by third sector organisations as requested uh, by the committee. Also, members, um, there is a response from the Department providing a copy of correspondence regarding the Victims' Pension Scheme, which the committee had requested. It is included in pages 6 to 18 <coughs> of the table pack. The letter states that there has been ongoing engagement between officials in the Department of Justice and the Executive Office on operational issues regarding the delivery of the Victims' Pension Scheme, and it includes a copy of a letter from the Minister of Justice to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, along with a letter from the Permanent Secretary Peter May to the Head of the Civil Service, David Sterling. Um, the Minister has stated her belief that the Department for Communities is best <coughs> placed to deliver the scheme, and her letter goes on to say um, that she would uh, take the scheme forward if designated to do so, provided that funding for the scheme and its administration is in place, that there is a date for delivery of the scheme uh, to be agreed with her, and that responsibility for decision making uh, is also passed to the Department of Justice rather than uh, the DOJ being a simple delivery mechanism for decisions that are reached by the Executive Office. So, members, the information is there by way of the additional finance uh, uh, in respect of the budget, budget information that's there for members uh, to note unless there's further issues to raise in respect of the financial information and also then members we have the correspondence now that the committee had asked for in respect of the uh, victims uh, pension issue. All through. Yes chair, uh, thank you. First of all can I just say on the financial side of things, um, it states there, states there in the main pack about uh, the Department of Finance uh, allowing departments, I think guidance was issued on the 22nd of May, that allowed uh, for a reduced uh, performance disclosures of the 2019-20 annual report and accounts. I would have thought at this time, through crisis, that this is the time to make sure that every move we make is accounted for and is valued. Uh, and I know in the heat of a crisis and a battle, that can go out the window at a certain point of time, but you really want to claw that back as soon as possible. So whilst it's a DOF issue, which I will be raising in the committee, I, I, I would applaud the department for the fact that they have uh, said that no, they wouldn't take up that opportunity to put in a reduced uh, form, and that uh, they went with the whole time scales and the whole package. So that's something that the Justice Department should be commended for. And I'll chase up with the Department of Finance as to why they were allowing reduced uh, performers to go in. On the actual victims piece, uh, you know, this, this really needs resolved as soon as possible. And I can see, first of all, it talks about correspondence, and I'm thankful for the Justice Department for, for releasing the correspondence, but it's, it, it's only one way. We have a letter from uh, the Permanent Secretary to... Uh, Sterling, I think, and then we have the minister's letter. I, I can't see, maybe I'm wrong, I can't see any sort of responses that they've got, so we, we can't see the to and the froing. And Peter May, Permanent Secretary, in his letter dated the 18th of February, raises a number of concerns that he has uh, with regards to the administration of a scheme. Uh, and again, when you look at the date, February, well, you're, you're saying, well, look, the Permanent Secretary has a right to raise these. 
and he has a right to receive answers and responses. So I would like to see what the response was to Peter May. I must say that throughout these two letters, there there is a, a certain speak uh, threaded through them with regards to negativity. And I know that's civil service land, but you know something, it's, pinch, it's, it's victims here at the end of this process, and those victims deserve this pension. Uh, they've deserved it throughout the whole of their lives. Some of them are now coming to the end of their lives. Some of them have passed away recently. And it really is important that we get this nailed. So I would like to see a fuller to and froing of the correspondence and the exchanges that we've had between the Department of Justice and the Executive Office and the Head of the Civil Service. Uh, but, you know, we just need this nailed and we need it done. And looking through some of the rationale for the queries uh, from uh, Peter May and the Minister. Uh, some of these, I feel, could be easily resolved. Uh, they, they talk about the compensation uh, services being a small team of 28. You would envisage that this would have to be stocked, staffed with more people to administer this. Um, and, and so what is the process and the procedure in order to get recruited more staff in order to fulfil this commitment? Uh, and, and that would be the same no matter whether it was Departments of Communities or Department of Justice. Uh, the, the, the issue about aligning it with the compensation services staff and then the Permanent Secretary goes into the fact that they, ha they have just recently moved into a new place. Well, this should... If this is such a mighty burden on a department to, to run this scheme, well then, give them their own place. Find a place for additional staff to administer this. Someone must administer this pension. If it's going to be Department of Justice, let's get cracking on and let's get it done. Uh, I'm, I'm getting cross as I, I, I go through this, Chair, but uh, it talks then also about the system. The system not being geared up uh, to account for this. And if somebody passes away, they won't be able to, to uh, retain that information or find that information out. Surely that has to be done. So again, we need a procedure in place. We need a mechanism in place that will account for all of that. So that needs to be done. That has to be cracked on with. Uh, and then the, the, the paragraph nine of Peter May's letter states about reputational damage and risks. And I find this really strange. Because what is he, is he actually saying there, well, they got a decision wrong in the past and they don't want to highlight it now? That's, that's a very bad place to be in. So are we going to stop administering this scheme or prevent this scheme from being administered for fear of reputational risks of decisions that was made in the past? That's the wrong way to look at this. And I'm aggrieved at that last paragraph. And I think that's something that we need to apply pressure on to get this done. I have certain sympathies for DOJ, because if you like, the executive has basically plumped this down on somebody. It has to be somebody. And I do believe that a Northern Ireland executive or a Northern Ireland department should run this uh, scheme, administer this scheme. They shouldn't pay for it. To me, that's the British government should pay for it. Uh, but they should administer it. So whilst Peter May is right to raise these issues at an early stage to David Sterling, I would like to see David Sterling's response, and then I would like to see uh, how these issues that have been raised, some I don't believe are issues, how have they been uh, resolved? And why have they not been resolved by now? Because this is pensioners, this is victims' lives we're talking about, many of them pensioners and they haven't received the support they've had throughout their life. And now, at the twilight of their life, we can give them some support, and it seems to be there's barriers been placed around the administrating of this scheme, and that's, that's woefully wrong. I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you, Brady. Chair, um, thank you, and, and I concur with, with, with Paul on, on, on pretty much everything uh, that he says. I mean, this is a, a mess. I mean, this is a real mess. And it is the executive officer's mess, and let's not forget that. It's not the DOJ's mess, it's the executive officer's mess um, for not um, bringing this forward 
but I have real concerns about this. And, 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 and Paul's absolutely right. We have got letters going out, but we have no responses, so I can't see that. And there's a line in this which really does raise a concern. And that line at the bottom of, of the, the, the Justice Minister's letter, which says it would be important that responsibility to make decisions regarding delivery of the scheme also passed DOJ. Um, no, they, they would be the administrators yep. for a scheme that has been set up in, in Westminster. My belief is, and, and this is where I probably disagree slightly with, with, with Paul, is, is I believe that the Northern Ireland Office should own this and it should administer it from London because it's a UK-wide scheme. So not only are we looking at Belfast and Londonderry and Armagh um, and Ballymena, but we're looking at victims in London, uh, in Birmingham, in Manchester, in Warrington, in Australia, in Canada, uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, and farther afield, anywhere where the victim now resides, that's who we have to deal with. So that should be done a, a, as a UK-wide scheme, and I've, I've pressed the, um, the, the Secretary of State to take this back. But it does concern me, these letters, that if DOJ were to take this on, and they have given caveats, and they are very negative in some of the things that they've said, but they do not become the decision makers. You know, the decision is the, the legislation that decides who gets it, and the guidance comes from the Secretary of State. DOJ would have to be the administrative body. That's what it's about, an administrative body. Um, uh, so I have a real concern. I would like to see the responses to that. Um, I would like to see if, if the Executive Office had said to DOJ, yes, if you get this, you will be able to make decisions, um, because that concerns me. I'm happy to get all of that information from members um, and make that request and think they're valid. You know, I'm deeply concerned when I read the correspondence from the Permanent Secretary you know, that there isn't a can-do attitude here, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Can't do and why not to do it and who else should be doing it. Well, either the Department of Justice is part of the collective executive or it's not. Yeah. And from the evidence here, it's the silo mentality, it's DOJ. And if you do then want us to do it, these are the rules by which we will take it on. Now, I get some of the commentary around staffing and, and, and capacity and, and all of that, but you're part of the same civil service. So I don't see how you cannot reconcile those logistical issues that have been highlighted back in February. And what concerns me is in the minister's letter, she highlights in her correspondence you know, that you're aware of ongoing discussions that have, that have taken place. Yeah, her department has been clearly heavily involved in these discussions, going back to a letter that was sent by the Permanent Secretary in February. And still, we have all of these obstacles and barriers being put in the way. And so I, I am deeply concerned at the approach the Department of Justice has been taking in respect of this. Uh, and the caveated approach around, one, an agreement needs to be found where a new date is set in terms of the delivery of it. The decision-making authority where this will then rest. I agree with members that have said the legislation sets out the guidance, sets out the parameters, whether we like it or not. That's the law. So therefore, get on and start the administration process for it. And DOJ need to be administrating the scheme if that's the body that's going to be doing it. So we really need to see an approach now that puts this into place, not uh, the barriers that are being put up, those barriers need to be swept away and Minister Long needs to assist in that process and remove these barriers, um, notwithstanding uh, some of the wider political debate that, is, that has been taking place and being uh, voiced by other members of the executive. Um, that's now by the way. The law is the law and if you get a legal challenge you're going to lose it. And I agree with what Minister Long has said in that. This is going to be challenged in court and the executive will lose. So therefore, we need to see a process in place that gets on with the process. Uh, I'm just concerned at the barriers that DOJ um, seem to be putting up, um, which should be overcome, and members have articulated that very well. So let's get the correspondence back. What was David Sterling's response um, to Peter May's uh, memo? Um, and also, we want to hear, uh, in, in terms of the response uh, from the Executive Office as well, um, to the letter that Naomi Long uh, sent um, and we need to get drilled into this issue and ultimately it may be one that we're going to need to have the Minister and the Permanent Secretary come before this committee to explain uh, the position that they have adopted in, in terms of this process. Gordon Dunn. Thanks Chair. I fully endorse what you've said. I think 
Uh, this has gone on for far too long. I think the, the public out there cannot believe what, what has happened here and how this issue has been knocked around. And um, innocent victims that we certainly want to see uh, treated fairly and given some form of compensation or, or being delayed and further delay it is unnecessary and unwarranted and I think anything that can be done to move it forward. I suppose there is a strong argument that the Department of Finance should be managing this project but that does not seem to be forthcoming and, and I suppose we've moved on from that but we would assume that they have the expertise to do it but uh, I fully endorse, in fact they've written down that very note, it's, there's a can not do attitude rather than a can-do attitude by the civil service here, and it's not acceptable. And that's why we are elected as representatives to be in, in committees like this, to scrutinise the work of, of the department. For far too long, civil servants have sat in their comfort zones, but they do not disturb sign-up, and it's not acceptable. Things have to change, things have to move forward, and people have to adapt. We, we think about what happened to the health service, see how they adapted, how they changed, to manage the COVID crisis, and they had to be commended for it. But for the Department of Justice to say, no, not my job, uh, we, we don't have the resources to do it. The Permanent Secretary needs to get, to get his act together and put a business case to justify additional resources to manage this. If civil servants need additional resources, they need to justify them. They need to put a business case forward and get it approved. And as you've said, Chairman, it's an executive decision the executive wants this delivered. We all want it delivered in the interest of justice and fairness. And the sooner it's done, the better for all. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to echo a lot of what Gordon said, I think it, it's about getting to the end game here now. Um, but I, I appreciate we're looking, and rightly so, as a justice committee, we're looking at it through that lens. And my understanding was that it was in the absence of there being an administration to deliver that there was an offer from the Department of Justice, but that didn't naturally seem to be the first and obvious home to deliver on this, because there are resources in other departments that marry neatly and more quickly to this. And whilst we have a duty to look at it from the Department of Justice perspective, let's not throw out the possibility, is it still the fastest way? to get to the end goal by utilising whatever resource we have via the executive office. I want to know the quickest way and, and the, whoever the administration is behind this will be led by the legislation. So that, that is just a false start in terms of that debate. But I don't think we, need, we should allow the executive office off the hook in finding the quickest route to get into the solution. We should, like I say, and I will repeat, uh, scrutinise and look at the Department of Justice's offer. But if that's not the fastest way of getting to the end, I'm not precious about who administrators, the administrator is on this. Let's get the money to those who deserve it. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, just to follow on there, um, there's mention in Peter May's letter with regards to DFC, and I know that that had been spouted at the start uh, as being a, a more appropriate um, home for this, but... Um, you know, can, can we clarify if DFC have had been approached? Is there, you know, is there been communications? Obviously, don't sit in the executive, not an executive party, so not, not given the information on this. But there is mention in the in the letter from the department that there has been ongoing engagement between officials in the department and the TEO. But what other engagement has there been going on between the TEO and DFC? Um, is there barriers been put up by DFC on a similar line, say, as, as Mr May's letter, or are there legitimate concerns? If there's concerns under resourcing, get resources. This is, I think there's a, there's a lot of been kicking this around like a political football. At the end of the day, these are victims who are literally dying that are the, the, the centre of this, and it's not to be turned into some you know, pointing fingers and blame to, to different parties. This, this needs to be sorted out as soon as possible. So if there's any way of this committee getting information about if there's barriers been put up by different departments, I think it would be helpful for us in our consideration of this. But also just if, there's, if there are problems um, with regards to being implemented from TEO, we need to figure out why. Because it's, it's certainly, you know, there could be, without the answering the funding question, which is a, a different matter, but who should pay for it? Um, this legislation has been in here since January. Mm -hmm. So why has it not been set up? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you know, we, we seek to get sight of the correspondence because it will help give context to 
the correspondence that we have had, but in the absence of other communication, you know, I think we're missing a piece of the jigsaw on this. So I'm quite happy that this committee seeks that information and we write to the appropriate um, committee departments in order to to, to uh, request that. I just raise one thing that Doug has raised. Uh, the last line of Naomi Long's par uh, last paragraph states it would also be important to responsible to make decisions regarding delivery of the scheme also passed at the OJ. What does that actually mean? Yeah. Decisions regarding delivery of a scheme because we know there's a panel uh, set up to, 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 to you know, see who, who, uh, is who should get those pensions. So is it, is it that decision? making process or is it some other decision making process it says decisions regarding delivery of the scheme mm -hmm. I think that needs clarified from the Minister it does yeah ok members this will be coming back to the committee of no doubt um, because we, we need to get this sorted item 6 um, pages 117 to 223 the Department of uh, Justice and Department of Health are shortly publishing a five-year action plan under the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse seven-year strategy, as well as a progress report against the Year 4 action plan. Um, in the meantime, the Department has provided a list of some of the key actions in the plan that it will be involved in, and some of the key aspects <coughs> in terms of progress against the Year 4 action plan. So it's there for members to note in terms of the information and also to advise that the new action plan and progress report will be placed on the agenda for consideration at a future meeting uh, whenever it becomes available, noted. Mm -hmm. um, item 7, the Department has provided the results of the targeted consultation on the use of live link technology for reviews of police detention, extension of pace detention by a superintendent and by the courts and for interviews of a detained person. Uh, the majority of respondents supported the use of live links for extension of pace detention by a superintendent um, or above and by the courts. Comments focused on the need to ensure the introduction of the proposals will not undermine the rights of the DTNE and the need for appropriate safeguards, including legal representation. Uh, there were also no objections to updating terminology in relation to the reviews of police detention by replacing the term video conferencing with live link. Um, with regard to the proposal relating to police interviews via LiveLink, almost half of respondents objected to this, with comments primarily focused on concerns around the ability of the detainee to understand the proceedings and participate as effectively as well as the necessary safeguards uh, to ensure particular vulnerabilities are considered. The Department acknowledges those concerns and the need for safeguards. It intends to include provisions for all the LiveLink proposals in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill but will commence them by order of the Department to ensure the updates to the statutory codes of practice can be commenced simultaneously. In the Department's view, this will ensure the concerns raised are addressed before the live link provisions are commenced. So, Members, it's just to, to seek your view as to whether you're content to note the results of this targeted consultation and the intention of the Department to include these provisions of live link proposals in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which obviously will give members an opportunity in due course. Yes, Chair, sure. can I just say um, I have serious concerns about this. Um, but the, nearly half the respondents raised concerns about the use of live link technology for police interviews. Um, and the department acknowledged the concerns, but hasn't noted any actions which it will take to adequately address these. Um, I don't think the department have any mandate to go ahead with this. And I'd actually, I'd want a full equality impact assessment on this before it, before they start to draft any legislation. Um, it's They can't be allowed to proceed um, because this law is very clear that if, if there is an equality impact on Section 75 group, then a full equality impact assessment needs to be done. And I think that I, I would be calling the department to do that before they drafted anything further. Okay. Well, are, are members content that we would raise, if I can try and get a, a way through this, one outline how they believe they're dealing with these issues that have been raised to what equality screening took place, because yeah. typically you carry out a screening exercise and then if that flags up an issue, you then move to a full equality impact assessment. Um, and if that is something that the department is going to be doing in advance of drafting the legislation, um, and once we get the response, then the committee can raise this again with the yeah. department, yeah. if members are content that we would raise those issues. Okay, Christine, you're happy. Um, item 8 then is some changes to the Human Trafficking Exploitation Act. 
um, pages 861 to 278, the Department is proposing to undertake an eight-week public consultation during July and August on two potential amendments to the Human Trafficking and Exploitation uh, Act 2015. Um, the first amendment would remove the statutory requirement to publish a strategy at least once every year and provide for a long, longer-term strategy with annual plans, which would provide the Department with the ability to set the longer-term direction while also delivering short-term operational plans. Uh, views will be sought on publishing a strategy that's approximately every three, four or five years and a progress report on an annual basis instead. Um, Section 18 of the Act provides assistance and support to potential victims of human trafficking. In March 2016, uh, David Ford, then Justice Minister, extended this assistance and support to potential victims of slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour. And the Second Amendment would now place this on a statutory footing. The Department would welcome any views or comments from the Committee and has provided a copy of the draft consultation uh, document. So, members, Mr Beatty. Chair, can I just ask a question? I'm not being pedantic here, but, but you see the First Amendment. Has DOJ provided uh, a, a strategy at least once every year for the last five years? Have they, have they done that? Have I missed it? I don't I need to check that. You don't know, Christine? Because I... Can I check my understanding? Oh, can you? Because, because the reason why is I wouldn't like to think that what they're doing is bringing this in because they haven't met their statutory responsibility. Whereas I can absolutely see merit in what they're trying to do. I wouldn't mind knowing if they had met those statutory responsibility in regards to this over the last five years. Um, if they have, great, if they, I think they have, but we will check it for you. We just them. check. But I think that's why they're finding it's coming round so quickly each time. And, and, and therefore, I have no problem okay. with that. But I'd just like to know where. What we did previously, just I mean, it's more of an information thing, if I can, uh, Christine, if you don't mind. Thank you, Chair. Just a minor point, Chair, because it's something that repeatedly comes up um, whenever there's mention of a consultation. Mm -hmm. And I, I just would seek clarification is there only guidance on how long a consultation should be? Is it at the discretion of the Minister in terms of the nature of it? And I'm particularly pointing it out now because when a consultation takes part, um, happens during what is the summer holidays, I suppose, um, if we can call it that in the year it is. But I would be particularly cautious of the catchment um, of any consultation that period. So I would just raise a question mark about that. Yep, no, I think that's very valid. Um, so before, obviously the, the department wants to raise this because I would like to, to know the, the rationale behind this um, proposed change, which is ultimately a change to primary legislation, and obviously the Assembly at a, at a time viewed this as the appropriate thing to do. Um, so I'd be keen to get the answers to that. Um, and, and just as a rule of thumb, I, I don't agree with an eight-week public consultation over July and August. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's an appropriate time for consultations to be carried out, even if it is a very niche area and targeted. Um, okay, we'll raise this with the department in terms of why the, the consultation over July and August ask if there's any flexibility in terms of those months. In, in principle, I'm not opposed to a consultation on this. You know, I'm, I'm not. Um, it's what then flows from it um, is the issue. Okay, members. Item 9, and the Department has provided a copy of the Access NI Performance and Activity Report for 2019-20. The cost of running Access NI was met by the fees generated and all key targets were met apart from the target for return of enhanced checks due to a PSNI backlog of cases at the beginning of the reporting period, which was then addressed but has more recently been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The report highlights that two barred persons were detected making applications to work with vulnerable groups together with one person who had a conviction disqualifying them for working with children. Access NI continues to work on the issue of a lack of certificate that can be updated and used by an applicant for more than one post, but providing an affordable and practical solution will be difficult and is unlikely to change in the near future. Members, it's there for noting in terms of the report, unless there's further clarity needed. I think, Chair, at least there is evidence there the system is working mm -hmm. in relation to rooting out those uh, undesirables that are trying to get access to children. So I think we note that and commend those that are involved. And it's important to keep up the standards. The backlog, I suppose, is still a problem at times. We, we should all get issues. 
they, they, actually, they talk about the PSNA. Or is the reason or the, the workload that they have, but hopefully that will be resolved fairly soon as the COVID requirements are, are somewhat stood down. Perhaps we could uh, maybe get an update on that at some time, Chair. Okay. Well, like I, I also want to pick up at a future meeting with the officials the issue around the one post not being able to get updated, you know, the current system, because, you know, it's, it's been advised about it being affordable and a practical solution, but it, it certainly is one that I think people struggle to understand. If you're approved for one, why not <laughs> approve mm. for something else? Um, and I think that does need looked at, Doug Beattie. I think is it, is there any way we can find out? I think it's a really important that they find two people who are fraudulently trying to apply for uh, an access NI. But I would like to know what the sanction was for that. What do they mm. do? Do they just identify that they were trying to do it? Was it by mistake? Was it a fraudulent claim? Uh, and what action was taken? Because if people can make fraudulent claims with no no recourse, then then I think it it needs to be tightened up. But, yeah, happy that we would ask. Yeah, just just yeah. to know. I mean, two is very small, but good to know. Okay. Okay, members. Um, item ten, correspondence. Um, I draw attention to uh, one of the items, which is item three. There's a report from Sajini on the child sexual exploitation in Northern Ireland and also the criminal justice system's response. The report raises concerns about effectiveness of current arrangements in place to protect children highlights a lack of clear leadership and strategic direction around tackling child sexual exploitation and makes two strategic and seven operational uh, recommendations. Um, so if members are content, we'll request a copy of the response from the department and the justice bodies uh, to these findings and recommendations, uh, and then we can look at that whenever we get the response. Obviously, we, we as a committee would get Sajini to come in, um, and I think given the nature of these recommendations, uh, it has highlighted in other areas of the justice systems, like prisons, very significant uh, advancement and reform, and it hasn't been felt necessary to you know, get a, a particular briefing on this. But I think this is one report where, whenever we get um, Sajeni before us, this will be an area that we'll want to look at. But let's get the responses back um, from the department and the other justice bodies in terms of the findings of this report, and, and then we'll take it from there. Um, Members content then to action the other items as outlined in the clerk's memo. I have no chairman's business. Any other business? Um, then our next meeting is on Thursday at 10 o'clock. And remember, that's a double committee with another meeting scheduled in the afternoon. So it'll be a long day for members. Okay, thank you. 30. This is...